Seattle, as well as Berkeley and the University of Washington. And he will talk about change your title. No, no, it's, it's. <laughs> OK, well, according to the schedule, he will talk about zero of the Gaussian analytic functions and variance and rigidity. Thank you, indeed. That's going to be the, the topic. And uh, I'll focus on these two aspects of these power series uh, or of these Gauss analytic functions that I've been interested in for a decade now. And I see uh, some, uh, some experts in the audience on these, uh, on these analytic functions. But before getting into them, so one thing I promise is towards the end to uh, explain uh, what you see here. So these are, this is a dynamical version of these, of these zeros. Uh, so, so they have very interesting beha dynamical behavior, which uh, has really only been, uh, the only the tip of the iceberg of that has been understood. So I said I promised to get back to that. Uh, so I'm going to start with the rigidity aspects, which are uh, more the topic of current work, and come back to the, emphasize the invariance later. So, so f uh, first I want to discuss some ongoing joint work with Shubro Ghosh, Fedro, Fedya Nazarov, and Misha Sodin. Uh, let's see if we can. Okay, so, so we're going to take a general perspective of point process and then specialize to the Gaussian zeros of interest. So we're going to look at uh, a point process. Uh, this, these will be simple point processes, so random collections of points in Euclidean space or hyperbolic space or on the sphere. Uh, we'll be interested in processes that have the natural invariance under the isometries of the space in question. Uh, the most studied example, perhaps too well studied, is the Poisson point process. And one thing to emphasize is how um, there are other interesting processes not related uh, that closely to Poisson that have been studied a lot by physicists, but perhaps haven't gotten as much attention as they should. Um, anyway, the key properties of a Poisson process are the independence between disjoint domains of the number of points, um, having a Poisson distribution in any domain with parameter which is proportional to the area. And if you condition on the number of points in the domain, they're just uniformly distributed and independent. So in general, for point process, we can think of it as a collection of points, or we can think of the counting measure that counts for every set how many points land in there as the basic object. Uh, so we can think of the point process as a random discrete measure. So the, of course, Poisson process doesn't have spatial correlations. And we're going to focus uh, now on two processes that do have some correlations, yet from a different point of view or in another, uh, after a transform, have extreme independence properties. So these are the Gini Bre ensemble and the uh, zeros of the Gaussian entire function. So they arise as uh, limits of eigenvalues of random matrices and zeros of random polynomials. They exhibit local repulsion. So So we can already start to see this in comparison of this picture of a Poisson process where you see there's some natural clumping that occurs. So just a piece, a finite piece, of course, of each process. So there's some natural clumping that occurs. This is the Gini Bre ensemble that I'll define shortly. But uh, it's just take a large matrix of complex Gaussians, so an n by n matrix of complex normal random variables. They're not, it's not Hermitian matrix. So all these uh, normals are independent. And you look at the eigenvalues and let the size of the matrix go to infinity without any normalization. Then these eigenvalues converge to a translation invariant point process. And what you see here is a finite piece of that process. 
Finally, here are zeros of this Gaussian entire function. It's essentially the unique function, uh, which is a Gaussian power series. So the coefficients are in Gaussian variables, and it has translation invariance. I'll come back to that. Okay, so it's hard, you know, in the, when you look at it, it's clear that this process is very different from these two. Our eye is not probably good enough to discern the differences between these, but here there is more rigidity in the right process than in the Gini breath ensemble. So, so the intensity of a process, uh, is, well, the one-dimensional intensity is just the density of this expected counting measure, and all our processes we consider have such a density. And, well, of course, we say that point processes converge if the corresponding counting measures converge as functionals on the continuous functions of compact support. So here's what I said before, emphasize. So if you define mu n as the eigenvalues of this Gaussian matrix, it's n by n matrix of complex IID Gaussian variables. So these are variables where the real and imaginary part are standard normals. And emphasize we don't normalize. And then we take a limit as n tends to infinity, and that's the Juniper ensemble. It has, um, it has other representations because it turns out to be a determinantal process, but this is the simplest way to construct it. And what's not obvious from the definition is that the limiting process is translation invariant. as a translation variant distribution. The other process we'll focus on, and I'll say later why these coefficients, so is the zeros of a Gaussian analytic function, which is the limit of these polynomials. So let's start with polynomials we get by taking, so these are again independent complex Gaussians, the Xi, the Xij. We divide them, divide the kth one by root k factorial, and look at this polynomial. So look at the zeros of this random polynomial uh, as a point process with just n points. And now um, take a limit as n tends to infinity. And here it's clear that intuitively and not hard to prove that the limit just consists of the zeros of this um, random analytic function. And it turns out this function is very special, very interesting, in particular, um, I can ignore Sasha Volberg here, who has really done some amazing work on understanding this function. Um, so again, this is translation invariant, and this, I'll, uh, this is easy enough that you'll see the proof of this later. So again, I mean, the process of zeros has a translation invariant distribution. The function itself is not translation invariant. If you um, look at instead of f of z, f of z plus a constant that doesn't have the same distribution, but luckily it's the same distribution up to multiplying by some function that has no zeros. That's why the process of zeros is translation invariant. Um, now one, one fact which is a special fact of what we call uh, Sodin rigidity, and what Sodin in his paper calls Calabi rigidity, is that this function is the unique Gaussian entire function with a translation invariant zero process. So, just like, so if you, um, so what does a Gaussian entire function mean? Well, you could define it as the coefficients being Gaussian, but that seems to depend on what point you develop around. It doesn't. But maybe a better definition of a Gaussian analytic function is just if you take the function and evaluate it at n different points, what you have is a Gaussian vector. So these, this has a jointly Gaussian distribution. And that's true for any n. So that's a, that's a, uh, so a Gaussian analytic function would be a random analytic function. 
with this property that when you evaluate at any finite collection of points, you get a jointly normal vector. Okay, so with that proviso, it turns out this function, just up to scaling, if you look at the zeros, so I have to be careful, what does this uniqueness mean? Because you could take f of z and multiply by e to the z, and you'd get the same zeros. So what it means is really the zero process is unique um, up to translation and scaling. Okay? And, uh, and you could say that any other Gauss analytic function which has the same zeros is just uh, related in a, very, in a very simple way by um, just by multiplying by a function with no zeros. So in his, as I mentioned in his paper, Sodin uh, calls it Calabi rigidity, and there is some vaguely related notion of rigidity due to Calabi, but I was skeptical, so I you know, showed Sodin's theorem to Calabi, and he completely disowned it. So that's why uh, we, we decided to call it by this name. Uh, he appreciated it, but he said it's not his. <laughs> so now... One aspect that will distinguish this series from its hyperbolic analog is uh, the question of deletion tolerance. So if we have a point process, it's, well, here's an informal definition. Uh, it's deletion tolerant if when you remove a point pro from the process, you can't tell. Um, so what does it mean to remove a point? Well, let's be a little more formal. You take, you take some finite domain and some bounded domain, like a disk, and you remove all points that happen to land in that disk. So that defines a transformation that will go from a distribution pi to a new distribution uh, pi tilde. And the fact is that this distribution is absolutely continuous to pi. So when you see, you, you sample from, from pi, and then you remove the points in a disk, or in a finite domain, and then you look at it and you can't tell that something's missing, what you see could have occurred in the original process. So let me already jump ahead and say that this is a property which the, which the uh, hyperbolic analog has. So let's look at the function sum a n z to the n. So this will be our, the other major player here, where again a n are independent complex normals. Okay, so this function is now only converges in the unit disk. So it's natural to think of it as uh, corresponding to the hyperbolic plane, and it does, because it turns out the zeros of this function are invariant under Mebius transformations. Again, the distribution of zeros is invariant under Mebius transformations that preserve the unit disk. This process is deletion tolerance in the sense that if you take any domain of finite hyperbolic area, for instance, any, any disk strictly contained inside, and remove the zeros that happen to fall there, the process you get is absolutely continuous to the original process, so you can't tell that something's wrong. This will, okay, this will contrast with the behavior of this Euclidean process, so this is deletion tolerance and will contrast with rigidity that we have in the Euclidean version. So the similar notion of insertion tolerance, where we take a domain and we add a point there, say, distributed according to Lebesgue measure in the domain, and we say, can we distinguish this from the original process? Um, so these have been studied, especially in percolation, in the discrete setup where they're related to uniqueness of infinite clusters. Uh, but more recently, um, it's been studied by, in joint work with Hoffman and Holroyd on fair allocation, and in, uh, in spe especially in work of Holroyd and Sue, who studied this phenomenon in point processes in general. So, So to study the opposite of deletion tolerance, we're going to look at, look at the disk or another bounded domain, look at the points of the process outside the disk and ask what 
do they tell us about the point inside the disk? So if we have a Poisson process, the answer is absolutely nothing. And I want to see what's the difference um, in, the, in these processes. So here is one of the main results concerning the Ginebra ensemble. So for the Ginebra ensemble, you can tell if there's a missing point. So this means that if you see this infinite ensemble in the, in the whole plane outside some bounded disk or any bounded domain, then they determine exactly how many points you have inside. Now, um, okay, well, here's, here's, one, here's one proof of that. So it's certainly true if I take the finite process, right? If I take the eigenvalues of the n by n matrix, I know that matrix has n eigenvalues. It's easy to see they're all different. So of course, there, if I'm looking at that process, I just count how many points I have outside do n minus that and see how many points I have inside. So, so all these finite processes have this rigidity property, and you know, the Gini is just the limit of those, so maybe we're done. Any? <laughs> but I probably wouldn't state it this way if, if that was it. So the point is, if you take, you know, take a disk of area n and take finite endpoints uniformly distributed in this disk, they have, of course, the same rigidity property. So if I take any finite disk, I can determine from the points outside how many points are inside. But of course, the limit of this, of n uniform points in the disk of area n, is just a Poisson process in the whole plane that has absolutely no rigidity. So rigidity really doesn't, this notion of rigidity, which means I can determine how many points on the inside from the outside, certainly doesn't survive under weak limits of uh, point processes. So this is really an interesting property of the infinite Ginebra ensemble, and really maybe this whole subject is about careful interchange of limits. Now, however, the hard thing is not what I just said. It's actually, that's actually easy to prove. The hard thing is the statement that the points outside determine the number of the points inside and nothing more. So they don't tell you anything about where the points are inside. So if you know there's one or you know there's three, that's all you can say. What does it mean in nothing more? Well, what it means is that given this measure of the points in the outside, the conditional distribution inside is just equivalent to, uh, you know, so you know there are k points inside, uh, it's, uh, or say n of omega points inside here, then the conditional distribution given the outside is just equivalent to uh, n of omega points independently distributed according to Lebesgue measure in the domain. That's, uh, so there's really no, no substantial additional information. And moreover, the conditional density of these points can be bounded in terms of a van der Mond. So so up to, up to random constants, so these constants depend on what you see on the outside. So from the outside, you can compute, in principle, some uh, constants, little m and capital M. So the randomness just means they depend on the points outside. And then the density of the zeros inside is uh, the van der Mond squared of, is just a van der Mond squared up to this constants, little m and capital M. So that's, that's one theorem. Now what, what can we say about the Gauss analytic function? I'll come to that, but let me formalize what we just saw by this definition of rigidity. So I said a process is rigid if we can predict the exact number of points inside given the points outside. And we saw that the Gini Bray is, is rigid. Any finite point process with a fixed size of, is of course rigid. Uh, Poisson point process, which is the limit of rigid processes, is not rigid. Uh, so I emphasize again, rigidity does not pass to the limit. Uh, now let's go on to the uh, Gauss analytic function zero ensemble. So I remind you, I look at the series sum, psi, 
n over root n factorial, z to the n. And I'm looking at the zero zeros of this series. As I told you, and, and I will explain this, the zeros of this are a translation invariant process in the plane. And the points outside determine exactly the number of these. Do they determine anything else? Yes. They also determine the center of mass, or if you want, the sum of the points inside. Okay? So just from looking at the points outside, you know how many points are inside and their center of mass. Okay? And again, this is not so hard to prove. And okay, what's hard is the nothing more. Uh, and, and again, what this means is that you look at the hypersurface determined by, uh, you know, you have n of omega points. So let's, let me be more concrete. If we know there's one point inside, Okay, if the, that might be the conclusion from looking at the outside. If there's one point inside, then we know exactly where it is. If there are two points inside, then we know their center of mass. So, so if we know the center, so here is the disk. If we know, say, the center of mass is here, then the two points could be anywhere as long as the center of mass is where it's supposed to be. So... Uh, Right, so, so in the case of two points, you can say this very simply, that if you know one, then you know where the other has to be by reflection in the center of mass. So one can be, so there's only a finite subregion, uh, there's only a subregion of the disk which is possible because the reflection might land outside the disk, so that's illegal. But you look at the subregion of legal points for where the reflection is also in the disk, and then the point can be arbit an arbitrary location there and equivalent to Lebesgue measure. And more generally, it's just uh, the distribution is absolutely continuous to Lebesgue measure on this hypersurface where the uh, <coughs> center of mass is fixed. Uh, are there examples where some finite number of moments is determined, like seven moments is So, process is rigid at level k if <laughs> but, so, but unfortunately, we have the definition, but we don't have natural examples. So one can concoct artificial examples uh, where you have rigidity of any specific level. But it's not, it's not that fascinating. Uh, but because here, you know, 0, 1, 2, we have very natural, interesting processes of these um, notions. So let me see if I skipped anything. So... Um, Right, so, right, so we, exactly a point a process is rigid level k if the points outside determine, uh, you know, moments from 0 to k minus 1, but they don't determine anything more. And so we said Poisson is level 0, Ginebra is level 1, and the Gaussian entire function zeros are level 2 process, and one reason I wanted to present this is to challenge everyone here, find a natural level three process or anything higher than two. Um, by the way, one of the motivations for us to study this is application to continuum percolation where uh, you take these points of the process, draw large disks around them, and look at components where, you know, so you say connect two points if the disk, so you have disk of radius r, you connect two points if these disks intersect. Okay, so this is the standard thing in continuum percolation, usually done with the Poisson process. And with the Poisson process, it's well understood that the, as you grow the radius, there's a critical radius. For small radii, you have only finite component. Beyond some critical radius, you have a unique infinite component. Um, here, again, we expect and finally can prove something similar for Ginebre. Uh, it's not hard and was done before due to the determinantal nature of the process. For the Gaussian entire functions, this was a challenge and the uniqueness of the infinite component 
follows from this um, <laughs> limited rigidity. So maybe if I have time at the end, I'll come back to, to explain this connection. Yes? No, they're not. So, they're, they're, they're. so the Gaussian analytic function in the disk is a determinant of process. Okay. So this one, this one is, is determinantal, and uh, I'll come back to say what that means. But, uh, but this one in the whole plane is not, and that really complicates the study. But, yes? Did you say that? Okay, we can discuss later. So, so, again, the uniqueness of the infinite component is derived directly from this, uh, from this theorem. Um, so, let me explain the, the relatively easy part, the uniqueness. I'm sorry, the rigidity of the number of points of the zeros of the Gaussian entire function. So the key is to use a calculation by Sodin and Cyrilson. <coughs> so take, fix, a, fix a function phi, which is approximately the indicator of the unit disk. But in reality, we want it to be a smooth function, which is bigger than the indicator of the unit disk, but bounded by the indicator of a larger disk, okay, say of the 2D. So take a, a smooth function like that. You can make it C infinity. Okay, and then scale it. So phi sub L is phi of Z over L. So this is the same kind of function, but where this is a disk of radius L, and then this is a disk of radius 2L. So the function is approximately the indicator of this large disk, but is smooth. Okay, and then you count the zeros using this function. So, so the integral of phi ld nu it just means we add up this function evaluated at the zeros. So in effect, we're counting the zeros inside this disk, plus the zeros outside are counted with some fractional weights that you know, decay smoothly to zero as we move out. But roughly, it's the number of zeros in the disk of radius L, but with kind of a smooth cutoff instead of cutting it with an indicator. And so that's what this integral signifies. And it turns out this integral is amazingly concentrated, unbelievably concentrated. So, the, so if you do this for Poisson, what would happen? If you count the number of zeros in a disk of radius L, well, essentially you're summing um, L squared so the area here is L squared, so you're summing L squared independent variables. So the expectation will be of order L squared. That's also true here. But the variance would also be order L squared, so the fluctuations would be order L. Okay, so that's if you do it for Poisson. Um, let me say that if you do this for Ginebra, the fluctuations will be order 1. But if you do this for the zeros of the Gaussian entire functions, the fluctuation, and, and you do the smooth counting. So if you just do the indicator, the fluctuations are still going to go to infinity because of boundary effect. So whether a point happens to be just inside or just outside the boundary will have an effect. So the variance would be order L if you use the indicator. So order L instead of L squared, as you get for Poisson, but still L is growing. But if you do this smooth cutoff, the variance is going to zero. So it's order one over L squared. So what this means is that with this kind of counting of number of zeros, weighted counting, you know the number of zeros exactly to an error that's going to zero as L tends to infinity. Kind of amazing. But you know, the variance is not really hard to calculate. It's just amazing that it comes out this way. And Okay, and then, and then from that you can, so you see you have a function that's so concentrated, you're removing one point 
in a disk of radius L would have this huge effect. It would reduce this changes thing by one, which is an unbounded number of standard deviations. So, so just by examining this for large L, you can tell uh, if a point is missing. Okay, so, so remember our setup is we're now going to take a disk we take a bounded disk, so you can take, think of a disk of radius 1, and we know all the points outside, and we want to ask something about the points inside. Well, if we know all the points outside, we can then compute the contribution to phi L from all the points outside. So all we're missing is a contribution of, to this counting of the points inside the unit disk. And we know this contribution very precisely. Yes? This is special to the disk, or it works for some other domains? It's, uh, the, it's not special to the disk. So it works, for all, it works for all bounded domains. All bounded domains. Yes. So again, the functions. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Can you smooth phi and did this rescale? Yes. Yes. So, so the rescaling works, right, for any smooth phi. It has to be uh, C2 smooth. Okay, so, um, but also the rigidity property, knowing the points outside gives you the point inside. Works generally. And if you look at the, this argument, it, it doesn't really use uh, the fact that it's a disk. Just just it's a bounded domain is enough. Okay, so you can always take a bigger disk. That's right. That's right. For example. Yes. Okay. Um, So now I want to compare this to some properties of this Gaussian entire function. So the same idea, but we don't divide by root n factorial. So this function is, uh, you know, converges in the unit disk. And, and the zeros have the relevant invariants. So the invariant under all the Möbius transformations, here I wrote them out, that preserve the unit disk. This has been uh, recognized first in the physics literature. One references a work of Hanai, but there are others, and then uh, and then built on by mathematicians, including Zeldich and Schiffman and, and others. Um, Okay, so, so this invariance, how does one prove it? Well, you just uh, check that when you apply a Möbius transformation, uh, um, you get to F, to the arguments. So you look at FU composed with this Möbius transformation, you get a new random entire function, which, I'm sorry, random analytic function. It doesn't have the same distribution as the original, but it's the same up to a multiplicative factor that has no zeros. This is a calculation that's not too hard, um, but in view of time, let me just do the Euclid of these two calculations. Let me just do the Euclidean one and then leave this one as an exercise. You can find it uh, in many places, including, uh, for instance, in my uh, paper with Virag or in the later uh, small monograph we wrote together with the Manju Krishnapur and Ben Hoff which discusses Gaussian analytic functions and determinantal processes. So, but let me do the Euclidean analog explicitly. So remember, we, in the Euclidean case, we looked at this function. So now I'm writing a n instead of xi n, but it's the same thing. And we want to understand uh, the translation invariance properties of the zeros. So 
So let's look at the covariance function because we know that the, for a continuous Gaussian process, the covariance kernel determines the distribution of the process. So let's look at the covariance at two points. But again, we have to be careful. This is a complex analytic process. So the right covariance to look for is the expectation of f of z times the complex conjugate of f of w. So if I wouldn't take complex conjugates here, I would just always get 0. So this is the right thing to look at. And this uh, determines the distribution. And so if you look at, if you look at this, what's going to happen? Um, so you see, you take this product, so you get, but claim only the diagonal terms survive, only the terms when n equals k. That's because if you have a n times a k bar when n and k are different, the expectation will just factorize, and you'll get expectation of a n times expectation of a k bar, which will just give you 0. So when you're taking this product and expanding, the only terms that matter are the diagonal terms. So when you take n here and the same k equals n. So when we take k equals n, what, are, what will we get? We'll get absolute value of a n squared, which has expectation 1, because this is a complex Gaussian of uh, variance 1. And it's going to be multiplied by z to the n times w bar to the n. So this is the series that we get. So it's just a series for exponential of z w bar. Very simple. So the covariance has this simple form. And, and somehow in this simple form, you can already see why the root n factorial is, is natural if you're going to be look, characterizing the process by covariance. The root n factorial is exactly what you need in order to get the exponential series. Now we're very close. So to check translation invariance, we add some number a. So, sorry, so this a has nothing to do with these. This a is now just a complex number that we're using to translate by. And so what's this covariance? It's, well, e to the z plus a, w bar plus a bar. And, and you see that when you um, multiply out on the top, what the main term you'll get is e to the z w bar, which was this covariance. And then the e to the z w bar is multiplied by some additional factors. Now you can simulate these factors easily this way. So this function is just the covariance of what you get if you take f c of z and multiply by, uh, by this, by this prefactor. Here's a constant and here is a exponential e to the a bar z. So if you take the covariance of these two things, what will you get? You'll get e to the z w bar from f c z and f c w. And that's multiplied by just the product of these two constants. And you'll get exactly the same as this function up here. Okay? So what this means, because it's a Gaussian process, is that the functions translated have the same distribution as the original function is just multiplied by these prefactors that have those zeros. So this means if these two functions have the same distribution, fc of z plus a and fc of z multiplied by this constant, it means that the zeros have of fc of z plus a and fc of z have the same distribution, which is just the same as saying the zeros of fc of z have a translation invariant distribution. Any questions? OK, so similar calculation works for the hyperbolic case. So um, so I want to say something about the uh, joint intensity and the determinantal nature of these processes. So first, what's the intensity function uh, for a point process? <laughs> so we're going to. So p epsilon of z1 to zn is just the probability that this random function f has zeros in epsilon balls around all the points z1 to zn. So we compute this probability, normalized by the volume of all these disks, so pi epsilon squared to the n. 
and take a limit as epsilon tends to 0, when this limit exists, this will be the joint intensity. And there's a calculation going back to Hammersley, who did it for polynomials, but this extends to these nice Gauss analytic functions, that, um, that you can, using the, this covariance matrix, or rather, yes, using this kind of covariance matrix, you can calculate the endpoint intensity. So this is, you can view this as an example of a variant of the Im implicit function theorem that allows you to calculate this kind of intensity. So this formula is, holds in great generality and gives you a formula for the joint intensity. Well, as I said, Hammersley did it for random polynomials, and then by passage to the limit, you can do this for a whole variety of uh, random analytic functions. And based on that, but substantial further work, uh, we showed with Balint Virag, this is already some seven, eight years ago, that the joint intensity for this process in the hyperbolic disk is, has a determinantal formula. So it's the determinant of the Bergman kernel um, written here. So this process has connections both to the Segel kernel and the Bergman kernel. I'll say something about that later. But the point is, I mean, here it just looks like, well, one calculated the density. But the moment it has a determinantal formula, it plugs into the very rich theory of determinantal processes. And um, again, in our, in our uh, monograph uh, with uh, Krishnapur, Hoff, and Virag, we uh, discuss you know, uh, how one exploits this. And I'll just give one example, because it also leads to an intriguing open question. So, so here is one consequence of the determ determinantal nature. Suppose you want to know how many zeros fall in a disk of radius r. Then this number has a very nice distribution. It's just the sum of Bernoulli variables, which are 1 with probability r to the 2k, and 0 with probability 1 minus r to the 2k. So you just sum infinitely many of these Bernoulli variables. And that has exactly the same law as the number of as the number of zeros in the disk of radius r. So here r is less than 1. And, and from this, you can deduce central limit theorems and very precise asymptotics. <laughs> so I want to mention two things in this connection. One is, I talked about conformal invariance of this process. What does that mean? Well, one meaning I already mentioned in the unit disk, if you apply a Mebius transformation, it preserves the distribution of points uh, in the unit disk. But there is another meaning. If you map, say, using conformal mapping, this domain to another domain, then you get a point process here, which has a natural direct interpretation in this domain. And what's that? See, so let's assume this domain also has a s smooth boundary. And you take Fn, which will be a basis. This is uh, domain omega. So there will be a basis of uh, H, H2 of omega. So, so by this we mean, uh, so this is this is analytic functions in omega, which are in L2, of the, so that have boundary values that are in L2 of the boundary. So you take a basis. So here the basis is just the function z to the n, and n ranges over uh, you know, from minus infinity to infinity. Sorry? 
Thank you. The point, we want them analytic, so we want a power series, not a Laurent series. And, um, right, so let's just use that numbering here. And then you could look at the Gaussian analytic function sum a n f n. which would be a Gaussian analytic function in this domain. Now, it seems to be there's some arbitrary choice of which basis. This basis is not unique, but any two bases are related by unitary transformation, and that will preserve the distribution. So while the basis is not unique, the distribution of this Gaussian analytic function is unique. So that's the Gaussian analytic function that uh, corresponds to the space H2 of omega, and it is mapped if you, ju if you just um, apply the... Riemann mapping from this domain to that to the argument, it will map uh, the, this Gaussian analytic function here to the one here. So that's the other aspect of conformal invariance. Um, I want to mention one open problem related to this series, and it's actually an open problem about general determinantal process, but it's easier to state in this case. So let's like, take this function. Um, right, so this is what we call the f u of z. Uh, so with zeros, so it has a set of zeros, zj. We know it has infinitely many zeros. So this is a random set of zeros. And Here's a conjecture for any function h, which is, well, which is in a, but let me say just, which is analytic in L2 of the unit disk. If H vanishes at all these points, then H is 0. Okay, so so note that here, this is not L2 of the boundary. This is L2 of the, uh, of, the, of the disk. And the reason this arises is because um, <laughs> this the series, <clears throat> okay, so it's because of <clears throat> the determinantal nature that I mentioned, um, right? So this Bergman kernel is just the reproducing kernel for this, uh, for this space, the analytic functions in L2 of D, and <laughs> so integrating against the Bergman kernel is just projecting orthogonal projection on this space from L2 of D to, uh, to this space. And uh, so, so this conjecture is an analog of a general property of determinantal process that uh, we know due to work of Ben Morris and then more generally Russ Lyons for discrete determinantal process. But the continuous analog is open, and this is an intriguing case of that. Now, of course, there's a very rich analytic theory of Bergman spaces and zeros, you know, what sequences force vanishing of a Bergman function. But this, as far as we've investigated, this exactly falls in the critical domain where it's not determined by all the known analytic criteria. Uh, so, so this is an open question. So finally, so there are some intriguing connections to partition theory, but I'll skip those. And I want to conclude with the, with the dynamics. So for all the, pro the Gaussian analytic functions, there is natural dynamics, which you get by taking the Gaussian variables and replacing them by Brownian motions or even more suitably Ornstein-Uhlenbeck processes. So, so recall, the Ornstein-Uhlenbeck is just a, 
rescaled Brownian motion. So we take a Brownian motion at time e to the t. So that will have standard deviation e to the t over 2, and we divide by that standard deviation. So now we have a stationary process. It's a stationary Markov process. Um, and we, <coughs> so we take this process in time, and we look at the random series with coefficients a and of t. So for any time t, the zeros of that are just, so Wn is actually a complex Brownian motion. So for any time t, the zeros are just the zeros of our favorite series over here. Because at any time t, the ornstein lunenberg process just has the distribution. All these independent ornstein lunenberg processes have the distribution of independent Gaussians. So this is a dynamics where the stationary distribution is the distribution of the Gaussian analytic function. Um, now, to understand this dynamics, one can do some stochastic analysis. And here is just the tip of the iceberg. So this is uh, already in, in the paper I wrote with Virag. But then there is more complete analysis later due to Krishnapur. So suppose we have, we look at the point um, of the process, and we can move, assume there is a point at the origin. And we want to understand how it's what is its infinitesimal movement? Well, it turns out that it's locally a martingale. So it's going to just move like locally like a Brownian motion with some standard deviation or diffusion constant that depends on the location of all the other points. And the, OK, so up to some normalization, the inverse of the standard deviation is the product of the distance to all the other points. So you have to be careful because this product uh, is not convergent. So, so that's why there are convergent fa convergence factors. But really, what this means is that the standard deviation is very uh, is given by the up to a constant by the product of one over the distances to all the nearby points because the effect of the faraway points is turns out to uh, average out. So this is what you see in this picture. However, in this picture, because of finiteness constraint, we actually looked at the spherical version of the process. But the local behavior is the same. So there is a version of this process that goes on the sphere. Um, and, uh, but, that's just, but the local behavior is the same. So each of these points is locally moving without drift yet they manage to repel each other. And the way they do that is how can points achieve repulsion without drift, right? You'd think that to achieve repulsion when points uh, get close by, they have to have drift away from each other, but they don't. The effect is when they get close by, they uh, start moving more rapidly. And so they quickly get out of the situation of being nearby. And that's how, why the stationary distribution has the repulsion property. And if you look closely at the picture, you'll see that when two pairs of points, when a pair of points get close, they start jittering much faster. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.